in the future. Yeah. Can I hear amen right here? Yeah. Glory to God. There are sometimes in our lives, just like the Babylon, uh, just like the Israelites were, they were in captivity in Babylonian, uh, down in, in Babylon, and they got a word from the Lord, and the word from the Lord was that, look, I think well of you. I'm about your welfare and not about your disaster. I mean, know that when you're going through, you need to hear words from the Lord. Amen. Well, glory to God. Tell your neighbor, say, you just got it. Yes. <laughs> glory to God. Now give him some praise for it right there. Come on, give him some praise for it. You just received it. But I start with this verse of scripture. Because God wants us to know that he thinks about our end. He cares about our end. There'll be challenges along the way, but God wants you to know, I care about your end. I have laid it out for your end to be good and not disastrous. And I just want you to declare out of your own mouth, hallelujah, Come on, the Lord, the Lord says, says my, end my end shall be good. Shall be good. One more time, the Lord says, the Lord says my, end my end shall be good. Shall be good. We want to deal a blow to the enemy because the enemy, he's all, he only comes to what? Steal, kill, kill, and destroy. But God says that I'm looking out for your welfare. I'm looking out for your future, and it's going to be good. Mm. And you can have a hope in that. Amen. You can rest on that. Amen. 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 So this is the heart of God. But then in order to reach our destination, in order to reach that end, in order to reach those goals that we often set and we desire and that we want, how many of you also know that we have a part to? Yes. We have a role. Because God, he's the God that does not violate our wills. He gave us will. And he allows us to make choices. And so we have a part to play in reaching forward and, and in reaching our goals and in reaching our destinations. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know today. That the very first thing that you have to do in order to reach your destination, in order to reach that end, mm -hmm. the first thing you have to do is you first have to set a destination. You have to set one. Without a destination being set, no route will get you there. Amen. It's true. Without a destination being set, no route will get you there. See, whenever we get ready to take a trip, we always set the destination before we leave. We don't leave and then get out, you know, four or five hundred miles out and say, no, where we going? Right. <laughs> How are we going to get there? <laughs> In order to reach your destination, we first have to set one. Yeah. We have to declare one. <clears throat> Because if not, if a destination is not set, if goals are not set, how will you ever be able to reach them? And so first of all, set your destination. What are you believing God for? Where do you see yourself down the road? 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Where do you see yourself? 
Sometimes we're not even able to see no further than where we are right now. Because we've we'll been in this place where we are right now a little bit too long. But God has already spoken to us through his word and through the prophet Jeremiah. He says, I have a great end for you. I have a good end for you. I have a godly end for you. But he says that you're going to have to participate in it. We have to set our destinations. We have to set our goals. Now, I want you to know that, glory to God, we're able to do that. How many know that we're able to do that? Yeah. All right, Isaiah 46 and 10. Isaiah 46 and 10. In Isaiah 46, verse 10, the Word of God says, He was declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Yeah. Tell your neighbor, say, God has the final word. God has the final word. But we do have to set our end and set our goals and set, you know, our destination. But God wants you to know that he has the final word. But look what God does. It says that he declares the end from the beginning. Yes. Now, when God spoke this in Isaiah 46 and verse 10, when he spoke declaring the end from the beginning, he was really speaking in comparison of himself to other idols and to other false gods. And he said that there is none like me. Amen. And he said, in one of the areas where there's none like me, he says that I'm able what, to declare the end from the beginning. I'm able to tell you what it's going to look like down the road before we even start out on the journey. Amen. 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 He says, I can declare. He says, these other false gods and other gods, they cannot do that. He says, but I am God and there's no other like me. Amen. I can declare the end from the beginning. Amen. I can tell you what it's going to look like before you even start. Right. And Jeremiah says that what it's going to look like is that you're going to have a good end. Come on now. Right. Your welfare is going to be well. Amen. Amen. Because I'm large and in charge. Amen. That's right. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Now, for us, are we able to declare the end from the beginning in our own natural strength? No. But how many of you know that there's a God in us? The God in us. Amen. So through the God in me, I'm able to set goals. I'm able to set, you know, destinations. I'm able to declare the end. Why? The God in me. The God in me. And so our role is one, set the destination through the God in you. Then two, secondly, we're going to have to prepare for the journey. Prepare for the journey. Now when I talk to you about preparing for the journey, I want you to understand that sometimes on the journey there will be twists and turns that will be beyond your control. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes. We have to prepare for the journey. And I also want you to write this down. Please do not ignore or disregard the journey in trying to get to the destination. Let me say it again. Please do not ignore or disregard the journey trying to get to the destination. The truth of the matter is the journey is the destination. Mm. Let, 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 let me let it set for a minute. I, 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 I say the journey is really the destination. Because
because you will never be able to arrive at the destination without going. And the Lord is just be revealing these things to me because sometimes we can get so caught up in the destination until we, 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 we try to just slide through the journey. And what we have to understand is that it's the journey that is preparing you. It's the journey that is shaping you. It's the journey that is forming you for But sometimes we get so caught up on the destination in the end. We should have it. We should have it set. That's because right. we got, we know, we it's something to move toward. But we have to understand that you cannot disregard the journey. That's right. That's right. And when we begin to disregard the journey, what happens is that sometimes we feel that we have arrived at our destination. Woo! And when you feel you have arrived at your destination and you haven't, given heed to the journey. You may think you have arrived there, but you will not be ready for that because you didn't go through the journey. To be shaped. To be formed. I look back at my life and as the Spirit of the Lord kind of reveals things. Uh, I look back at all the things uh, out of the errors and out of the mistakes and out of the falls. And I look back at all of those things in the journey and I realize that each and every one of them help me to get to where he has brought me thus far. I haven't reached it yet. And I know I probably got a long way to go. But I understand now that I cannot disregard and ignore things on the way because I'm going to need it. The journey. When Jesus came to us, the people they wanted him to skip the journey and just become the king. And it came a time where they was getting ready to make him king. And he had to slip away because he understood that he had to go through the journey. He had to deal with some suffering yes. before he was able to reach that goal and that destination. He had to go through the journey. Yes. And see, sometimes folk just want you to be there. Yeah. And when you try to be there because folk want you there, I want you to understand that it's not going to work out too well. Because you'll be lacking something when you reach that place that you could have gotten or should have gotten during the journey. How many know that when you're running low on gas and you're traveling across the desert? How many know that if you pass by that gas station and you only got, you know, an eighth of a tank left? How many know that you're running on dangerous territory? Amen. <laughs> Slap live high five. Say, don't pass it by. Don't, don't pass, pass it by. by. Not if you want to reach your destination. Not if you want to reach your destination. You better stop and refill. Amen. You better stop and get you a fill up, praise God. <laughs> But why is it yes. in life yeah. that we want to disregard the journeys and yeah. the experiences and the challenges that we have in life and route to what God is calling us to? Don't you know that God knew from the beginning? Yeah. Right. Right. And yet it's still, we, sometimes we say, well, if I can go back, I 
wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do this. And, and it makes a whole lot of sense with hindsight. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have did that. I, I wouldn't have did this. And, and, and praise God. Hallelujah. Come on now. Yes. Bless be. We all have some of those. <laughs> but I want to say to you that there are some things. Come on now. That came down your pipe. Come on now. Um, whether the choices you made or, or the choices somebody else made, whatever it was, there are some things that hit your pipe. How do you know that you wouldn't be where you are That's if right. you had not That's been right. That's right. If we're going to reach our destination, if we're going to reach that expected end, God wants all of us to know there's a journey. It's a process. And the Apostle Paul says, I fought the good fight. He says, I finished the race. He says, and finally, there is stored up for me a crown of righteousness. But before you wear the crown, you have to run the race. We cannot, church, in this year, 2019, expect to wear the crown when you haven't even ran in the race. It's not how he operates. I can remember some things vividly. Even though I'm going to tell you later on, glory to God, you got to learn how to forget some things. <laughs> but I can remember some things vividly along the way in the journey that I just felt like, you know, Throwing in the towel. I can remember some things. But each and every time I came close to throwing in the towel, it was something through the word of God or in prayer, you know, or through some encouraging word to where it says, I heard, I'll use it all. And I would hear that often. I'll use it all. Even before I was in ministry. I used to hear words. When, 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 when I was managing uh, restaurants. And you know. And overseeing people. And you know. And, and, and folk one. You know. Uh, acting right. And folk didn't show up on time. Have you ever managed some folk? Come on now. Glory to God. <laughs> You know, the, 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 the thing, the, the legit thing would be, well, well, well give it up. <laughs> Just, you know, fire. And then sometimes things can warrant that. But I noticed that I always had a heart to say, okay, now, you got to <laughs> come on, get this together. And they would get another chance. Sometimes another chance. And sometimes another chance. And sometimes I would go home because I would end up doing all the work. <laughs> Something they should have been doing. <laughs> I would go home sometimes and I'll, I'll beat up on myself. And I would say, why are you allowing this person, you know, to keep getting this kind of grace or this kind of mercy. Why are you allowing that? You know, you, you're working yourself. You're doing too much on yourself, you know, and, and I would hear these things and I, I would kind of beat myself up and, and, and I would come to the conclusion, yeah, I'm, I'm too nice. I, I got to be meaner. I got to be, you know, I, I, got, to, I got to be harder. <laughs> Come to work the next day. 
I come in there, glory to God. I'm going to crack my whip today. I'm, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to crack it. <laughs> and the very one that I says, I'm going to crack my whip on today. The one that's been sloughing off and the one, you know, that's been, you know, uh, always coming up with this and that and not fulfilling it, not doing what he was supposed to do. And I come in as I'm going to crack the whip that day. And that very one comes up and says, I know I should have been fired. I haven't performed like I'm supposed to perform. He says, but if I can just share with you what I'm going through. And he shared with me they had a, a newborn baby. He wasn't married, but him and his girlfriend, they had a newborn baby. Sick. You know, hospital sick. And he's trying to shuffle between work because, you know, I had him real early shift opening up. <laughs> He's trying to shift and do all these things. And, and he just says, I just want you to know I, I've never had a manager like you who has given me another chance. And he said to me, he says, you know, Ron, I want you to know that I'm, I'll, make, I'll make it up. I'll do whatever needs to be done. But I appreciate you giving me another chance yeah. another opportunity yeah. those things I remember vividly mm. now at this time you know I, I, I'm not thinking about being no pastor or shepherd <laughs> but I said I'll have to say this all along the way yeah. can look back and I can see that God was bringing me through a process and through a journey because when you stand in the office of a shepherd when you stand in the office of a senior pastor you're going to have to learn how to have some mercy and grace yeah. and you can't be pharisaical and you can't be Sadducees about it. Well, the law calls for her to be stoned. And Jesus lifts up his head and says, Let he without sin cast the first stone. If we're going to reach our destination, we have to be ready for the journey that he's going to bring us through. And the journey is not always going to be pretty, church. There's going to be suffering during the journey. There will be tears shared during the journey. But all of it, God will use. To get us where we need to be. Yes, Lord. Are you ready for the journey? Are you ready to stand in that place that God has for you? And understand that you cannot get there without going through the journey. Now these are some things that you must adhere to. If you're going to reach that destination. And this is going to be taking place as you're going through the journey. Take note of these things. First one is this. If you're going to make it to the destination. Understand first of all that. You must pray and believe for God's intervention. 
You must pray and believe for God's intervention. How many of you can honestly say that you wouldn't have made it if it had not been for God? Amen. During the journey and route to your destination, God's intervention will be required. Mm -hmm. Why? You will always run into something along the journey that is going to be beyond your control. Amen. And the scripture references that I would like to refer you to here, first of all, I want to refer you to Moses. Go to Exodus chapter 2. Moses, Exodus chapter 2. <coughs> Moses ended up being the deliverer of the people from the bondage of Egypt. But Moses needed God's intervention. Chapter 2. Beginning with verse 1. And a man of the house of Levi went and took as wife a daughter of Levi. <coughs> so the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him in three months. She hid him for three months. But when she could not, no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. And her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go! So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him, and the child grew. And she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. So I just say God's intervention. God's intervention. Come on, say it again. God's intervention. God's intervention. God's intervention. That was a decree that had been passed out that all the Hebrew children were to be killed. And he had first told the, 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 the Egyptian women, Pharaoh had first told the Egyptian women, kill these babies. Because it had been spoken that a deliverer was going to rise up from these children. So I want them killed. The Egyptian women couldn't do it. So they went back and told Pharaoh, said, wait a minute. Now, these Hebrew women, they ain't like the Egyptian ones. These Hebrew women, they drop babies so fast, we can't even get to them quick enough. <laughs> By the time we get to them, you say, they, 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 you know, they gone. They, they, they're not around. And so he passes this decree. He sends out an army to kill all of the Hebrew children. And then Moses is born. And he's hidden for three months. And when they realized that they could hide him no longer because they were getting closer and closer to him, they took him as a baby. Three month old baby. <coughs> Made a little pitch in a basket. Wrapped him in a Hebrew cloth. And had 
as he's floating on down the river among the, the reeds there on that day I don't want to say can't, can't. on that day in that hour here come Pharaoh's daughter come on now glory to God along with some of her maid servants coming down to the river to bathe how you know that God does have good timing how you know that he has perfect timing hey man comes and they see the basket and they realize there's a child in the basket and the minute that they see the basket and get the basket then Moses sister says oh <laughs> now that God has intervened she says do you need a Hebrew mother to nurse that child <laughs> But she goes sure and they take the child Moses is nursed by his own mother <laughs> and what make it so good is that God made Pharaoh now pay for it <laughs> that's God's intervention why because there's a destiny, a godly destiny, a godly destination that God has set, and it's a good one. Amen? Amen. But in order for us to reach it, I'm telling you right now, we're going to need God to intervene on our behalf. Yes. We need God to intervene along the way. Amen? Amen. Come on, just invite his intervention in right now. God, intervene! Amen. Because you're going to run into some things along the way that is going to be out of your control. <clears throat> We think of another young boy by the name of Joseph. God had a destiny for Joseph. God had a great destiny for Joseph. And so Joseph's brothers, they didn't like him. And the reason why they didn't like him and the reason why they envied him was because his father loved him more than he did them. He showed that favoritism. So his brothers didn't like it. They, were, they, they got angry. They didn't envy him. And so they had the opportunity to do him in one day. And so he, he come, you know, you know, you're bringing them food. You're going to check, you know, bringing stuff, doing something good. And they see him afar off and they say, here come this dreamer. They say, but we're going to kill him today. When he comes, they conspire to kill him. But then God intervened. And one of his brothers said, no, let's not kill him. No, let's just throw him in the pit. Intervention by God because they wanted to kill him. Now as he's in this pit, glory to God, they're thinking, still thinking about killing him. <laughs> Here come some Ishmaelites coming down the road on their way to Egypt <laughs> at the very time by the very pit that Joseph's in and one of the brothers says let's not kill him let's sell him into slavery they pull him up out of the pit they sell him into slavery they sell him into slavery but how many of you know that that was God's intervention? Yeah. Yeah. Because God needed him to get to Egypt. Amen. And so even though the journey didn't look good, I'm pretty sure it didn't feel good to Joseph. God got him where he needed to be. Because his purpose and his plan shall stand. <clears throat> and we know what happens when Joseph gets down to Egypt. He rises in power. And the very same brothers who sold him into slavery, he had to reserve their lives by a choice that he had to make. I say to you, church, in reaching our destination and getting to that end that God has set for all of us, we're going to need his intervention. Yes. 
And one of the things that I've learned is that I'm always wanting to invite God in because I know somewhere I'm going to need Him to intervene on my behalf. That's right. So I want to take a, a, a second or two out right now and I just want all of us to give God some praise for His divine. Thank you, Lord. another thing about Joseph which also is another truth that uh, the Lord has revealed to me in this journey of where he's leading me and where he's carrying me because I know glory to God that you know uh, I'm not at the end nowhere close but I believe I'm moving in the direction that God is calling me to move in and that is if you're going to reach your destination that God gives to you you have to be willing to be misunderstood at times. Joseph had a dream. And the dream that Joseph had, he shared it with his family, his brothers, his mother and his father. He shared it with them. Tell your neighbors that you can't share your your dreams and visions with everybody. <laughs> now when Joseph had this dream and he was telling them about it and he was excited about it and he was just like, oh man, you know, I had this great dream, you know, and he was so excited about it until he shared it with them. Now they already envied him. They already hated him because his brother had showed them favor. And he shares it with them. And then they say, does that mean that we're going to be bowing down to you? Hmm. And the father, his father, Jake even said, you know, well, does that mean that even your dad and your mom, that they shall be, you know, bowing down to you? The dream was not even about them bowing down to him. It was misunderstood. It was misinterpreted. The dream was about Joseph being promoted by God to a position of authority and power with the purpose of saving the nation of Israel, including his own family. But because they misunderstood him, when they saw him coming down the road that day, they said, here come this dreamer. We're going to kill him today. And I want to say to you folks, sometimes we have to know how to protect the vision and protect the dream that God has placed in your heart. You have to know how to protect the goals and you have to know how to protect that in place that God has shown to you and given unto you. You can reveal it to some folk, but some folks you need to keep it concealed. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you can be misunderstood and misinterpreted. But if you're going to reach that goal, you got to be willing to be misunderstood and misinterpreted at times. It's always best to go with God than to go with anything else. Amen. 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 And then we're quickly here. <clears throat> so if you're going to reach your destination, if you're going to reach your goal, when you fall, you must get back up. Amen. When you fall, you must get back up. Proverbs 24 and 16. Though a righteous man may fall seven times, but he'll get back up again. But when the wicked fall, 
they fall into a calamity. So God says, for the righteous, each time we fall, we have to get back up. I want to encourage somebody here today. You may be facing some things. You may be, you know, have something before you right now. But I want you to know that whenever you fall, glory to God, get back up again. Don't lie there. Only the wicked lies there. You are of the righteous. Get back up again and continue on with the journey that God has for you. Amen. Amen. Sometimes, depending on how hard we fall, We lie there. And in lying there, the enemy only comes along and kicks you. You would think when you're lying there that the enemy say, Oh, come on, let me give your hand. Get up. <laughs> no, he'll come along and he'll kick you while you're down. And so the righteous rises again. Do I have any folk in the house today, glory to God, to experience a fall or two? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Get back up. Yeah. Keep getting back up. Yeah. I don't care what the issue may be. I don't care what the challenge may be. God desires for us to get back up. Why? Because the end is great. The end is good. The destination, the destiny that he set is good, but you have to get back up. And so this day, I encourage every person who have experienced, who has gone through a fall or a setback, get back up. Keep reaching forward. Keep reaching forward. Keep reaching forward. I know that those things sometimes that are behind us, they try to pull us back at times, but keep reaching forward. Keep pressing. The Apostle Paul said this in Philippians chapter 3. He says, I press for those things which are before me. Forgetting those things which are behind me. Now when you read the text, it says, one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Look at it closely. He says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. The way you forget the things that are behind you. I say the way you forget the things that are behind you is that you got to be what? Reaching forward. You got to be doing what now? Reaching forward. You got to be doing what? Reaching forward. Reaching forward. To those things which are ahead. What is ahead of you? What is ahead of you? I'm not asking you what is behind you. I'm saying what is ahead of you? And God has already told us what is ahead of us. What is ahead of us? He says that I know the thoughts that I think towards you. And they are of good. Or they are of peace. And not of evil. To give you a future. And I hope. Great things lie ahead of you. But you got to reach. Great things lie ahead of you. But you got to reach. Great things lies ahead of you, but you got to reach. 
And glory to God as we come up on these 20 years and celebrate it and thank God for it. I want us to realize, hallelujah, 20 years are behind us now. But God has something good before us. God has something great in front of us. But we're not going to get it until we reach. And so that's my heart. Reach forward for the things that God has in front of us. Because they're good. And we can rest our hope in those things which He has before us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, say, my future, look, my future looks better than my past. Now go ahead and give him almost shout of praise. Yeah.